sayang. My humble pranams at the divine lotus feet of our beloved Guru, Sri Satya Sai Baba. To everyone gathered here today, a warm welcome and a very good evening. Before we begin, we shall start with three ohms. Today's session will be hosted by our Sai Mahila Creative Hub moderators, myself, Sister Niti, Sister Simran, and our guest of honor, Dr. Verka Lakshman. Before we start, we shall read out the guidelines and the biodata. Number one, requesting everyone to please mute your microphones. Memohon semua orang untuk memute microphone masing-masing. Number two, it's optional to turn on your videos, but please ensure your attire is appropriate. Anda bisa menghidupkan video. Itu optional. Tapi pastikan pakaian yang Anda kenakan sopan dan sesuai. Number three, if only you have an urgent questions, notify us in the chat box. Otherwise, the session today will cover all questions you have sent us through the Google form. Jika ada pertanyaan darurat, mohon beritahu di chat box. Sesi hari ini akan menjawab semua pertanyaan yang telah kami terima melalui Google form. Number four, for any technical problem with regard to sound, and other matter, do notify us on the chat box. Our Mahila Creative Hub team will assist you. Untuk masalah teknis sehubung dengan suara dan masalah lain, mohon beritahu di chat box. Tim Mahila Creative Hub akan membantu Anda. Dr. Worker Lakshman. Certificate of Knowledge in Clinical Tropical Medicine and Travelers in the University of Minyosta. Lamas International, Childbirth Education. Lamas International, United States, Washington. Diploma in Family Medicine. Graduate Diploma in Family Practice Dermatology, National University of Singapore. Honorary Fellow Medicine, National University Hospital, Singapore. Medical Doctor in Atma Jaya, Indonesian Catholic University. High School Diploma in Gandhi Memorial International School, Jakarta. So thank you everyone. So let's go to Sister Simran. Sairam, Sairam everyone, a very warm welcome to you all. We have with us Dr. Varka Lakshman, who, is the, who in the midst of her busy schedule has given her time to help clear all our doubts in regards to the pandemic. First of all, I would like to thank all the doctors around the world who selflessly work around the clock and provide care to the patients. Our deepest gratitude to all the doctors, nurses, clinicians and hospital staffs for being so brave during this uncertain time. Health professionals are heroes and no one will be able to, be, to go through this without them. No words can describe how indebted we are. We can just pray that all of them remain strong, healthy and never give up to heal the world. And we as citizens should give, up, should give ourselves should give our best by following the health protocols and rules that have been imposed by the government. Dr. Varka. 
Shall we begin with our first segment, Doctor? Sairam? We shall await Dr. Varka. Uh, Sister Neeti, is Dr. Varka in? I can't hear her. Hello. Yes, sorry. Um, the, yeah, go ahead, Susie. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Verka, um, good evening, doctor. Our first segment is with regard to the symptoms. Okay, the questions. Mm -hmm. so we have two questions. What are some differences between COVID 19 and influenza? How is Delta variant different from the first variant? Is there four different kinds of variant? And is it airborne? Okay, so um, COVID-19 and influenza are both viral infection. They both can produce symptoms like fever, headaches, sore throat, running nose, nausea, cough, cold. However, the COVID-19 can also trigger loss of sense of taste and loss of sense of smell. Okay. The only way to differentiate between these two is by doing the lab testing, which includes either an antigen test or a PCR test. So okay. how is Delta variant different from the first variant? Yes, so at the present moment, we are actually familiar with four types of the COVID-19 variant. Okay. So we are aware of the alpha variant, which okay. has emerged in UK, and we know that it causes a severe infection. At the present moment, we are also aware of the Delta variant, which emerged in India. And it, this Delta variant is actually a super spreader. However, the mortality rate from all these variants is still around 2%. Uh, the other type of the variant is the beta variant and uh, with the beta variant which emerged in uh, South Africa and the gamma variant which emerged in Brazil. So mm -hmm. the WHO and the CDC are still studying on the characteristics and will produce us more details when they know more about these variants. So is this airborne? Yes, this is an airborne infection. Yeah, so COVID-19 spreads when an infected person actually breathes out the droplets and the small particles that contains the virus. These droplets can be inhaled by another person when in close proximity with the infected person. Or if these droplets land on the eyes, on the nose, or on the mouth of a healthy individual. But it may also be trans. Sorry, it may also be transmitted from touching your nose, your eyes, or your mouth when your hands are contaminated with this virus. Yes, Susie, go ahead. Um, but doctor, you know, the, they say that the, the virus stays in the air for 16 hours. How, what do you say about that? Uh, if, the, if the air is well ventilated, you know, so in a, in a good ventilation, the, the virus actually does not stay in the air for 16 hours. So the, what we are encountering right now is in a, in a packed, uh, non-ventilated area. And if a person is infected, that person will be shedding the virus. And if there is no ventilation, then the virus can be spread even over two meters. So at this pr present moment, uh, we are recommended to maintain the two meters distance. But if the space is not ventilated, even after maintaining the two meters distance, you can still get the infection. So you always want to maintain the ventilation of a particular area. Okay. So it doesn't, it's not, it's not appropriate to stay in the air for 16 hours. Okay, so if suppose a person is isolated in the room and they open the windows every day, does the, uh, the virus 
dyes or how with the, with the sunlight and or anything like that? So ventilation actually helps to clear up the virus mm -hmm. and heat also helps to clear up the virus. Okay. And that uh, room spray and we are using that room spray, is it, I mean, uh, useful and it really kills the virus? How, what do you say about that, doctor? And what kind of a spray do you suggest? I mean, how many percentage of alcohol to be used? Right. So uh, as per our knowledge, you know, it's just a different variants but we you know we we are aware of it for two years now we've been living with it for two years now mm -hmm. so we know that uh, alcohol and bleach does definitely uh, help to clear up the virus you know so washing hands with the soap and water you know using alcohol mm -hmm. as well as bleach can you know can uh, can clear up the virus can kill the virus yeah okay, so all these sprays that is produced in the market are actually making use of these components so you can do it manually with you know all the knowledge you have or you can buy a, a ready-made uh, sprays you know it works equally effective okay so if you say even if the ventilation of the room suppose we go out of the house and go for a walk how much is the safety you, you can you explain like do you do you think we are prone more to the virus when you go out for a walk or at this situation uh is it an infected person going out for a walk or is it a no. non-infected non person going out for a walk a non-infected person so if it is an infected person definitely you would not recommend them to go out from their room so yeah. they should be on isolation in their so own room we are going for but a if it's person non-infected person so walking so you can definitely walk out there is no harm in walking out because the virus does not stay in the air but the the main thing is you know a lot of the times people walk with friends you know say oh. so they meet up friends on the way you know so right. it's another human being it's the transmission from one person to an, another person in close proximity so the walking itself is not problem but when you go out, you meet your neighbors, you tend to talk to your neighbors, you spend more than 15 minutes, you know, so you go to one house, the other house, you know, like you all meet out together. So a couple of group of people from different houses will meet together and walk together. Right. So the meeting and the walking is the, the issues, not only the walking itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Varka. So our mm -hmm. second sec uh, sec segment for this uh, session is on vitamins. Which vitamins would you recommend to take during this crucial time? Please specify the dosage for each age group. Do we need to take zinc every day, such as Zigavit, Bconz, anything as such? Doctor? Tough question, because I'm not a believer of vitamins at all. You know, so vitamins are supplements synthetic made. Yes, we know it has been there for ages, but it's again a medication. And despite being vitamins, it can still be harmful. So, um, you know, we have vitamins that, uh, that dissolves in water and if we have vitamins that dissolves in fat. So vitamin that dissolves in water, like the vitamin C, basically they are pretty safe. You know, so they, you know, they, when you consume them, they will be dissolved in the water in your body and excreted from your kidneys. Whereas, um, you know, like vitamin D, uh, zinc, they do have toxic levels as well in uh, for a particular body, you know. And when you have, you know, when you go into a toxic dose, you know, your body will definitely warn you. You know, you'll have this nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know. So again, you know, like um, you you definitely would want to consult with your doctor in terms of the supplements as well, because at a toxic dose, it can be harmful to you. So, so you have natural resources for vitamins, like eating healthy. Uh, I, be I believe in natural resources, definitely, because you can get zinc from your green vegetables. You know, as long as you take five servings of fruits and vegetables, you can actually fulfill the requirement of zinc from your vegetables. You know, your spinach, your, your broccolis, you know, your, you know, all the green vegetables, basically. And if you take high in vitamin C fruits, like kiwi, guava, apples, oranges, you know, you can get so, the enough uh, sufficient vitamin C to build your immune system. So, you know, if you have a balanced meal, you know, like five servings of fruits and vegetables, two servings of yogurt, you don't need any synthetic multivitamins or supplements. Okay, if in case anybody needs to take the vitamin C, what is the dose for precaution and what is 
uh, they need to take like 500 mg, 1000 mg? Uh, you can take as much dose as your stomach can tolerate because we know that your, your, the vitamin C uh, can trigger acidity. It can increase the, the acid and it can cause all the symptoms of acidity. Uh, the safety for vitamin C because it's uh, dissolved in the water from your body, you know, even if you take, you know, a 3000 grams of vitamin C, it will just get excreted in your urine. So you're just making your kidneys work more to excrete the vitamin C from your system. You know, so your, your body will take only what is required. You know, your body will take only what is sufficient for the body. You know, otherwise it will just all be excreted. So you can take 3000. It's just that you're donating to the company who makes the vitamins, but it may just be excreted from your, from your system. I see. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. So we shall move to the next segment. So the third segment. The test. Okay. We have uh, six questions on this, Dr. Verka. I shall read the three first question. When is the right time to do a PCR test for those who are not feeling well and for those who had a close contact with a COVID positive person? What does city value mean? Does it affect the period of recovery for those who are infected? Does it have bearing on the severity of the virus? Is chest CT scans and blood tests mandatory? Okay, so uh, the PCR testing, when do we recommend a PCR testing? So if the person has no symptoms, but the person has been in close contact to a positive case, okay? So the body needs time for the virus to replicate, you know? And when the person does not have symptoms, the body is trying to clear up the virus. So the amount of the virus in the body may be pretty small in quantity. So okay. the earliest you would want to do the test is between five to seven days. However, if the person is already symptomatic, so the viral load in the individual is already higher, you can do it at an earlier time. You can do it between two to five days. Okay. okay. So the city value. City value is the cycle threshold, which is used by the PCR machine. So till today, the, the, the PCR machine that we use in Indonesia actually counts only the qualitative of the virus. You know, it doesn't give us the quantitative number of the virus that indicates the infection of the person. So it does yeah, not give you a viral load. And the quantitative, you mean to say? So, so the qualitative just tells you that the machine is detecting the virus at a particular edge that is reported in the value. You know, okay. so it is, uh, it is like, you know, it is like you, you, you take a sack. Okay, you, you take, uh, you know, you imagine a sack, um, you know, uh, the, the, the two sacks, okay, two, two sacks, and in one sack, you, you fill it with cotton, and the other sack, you fill it with uh, metal, okay, so the, the sack that is filled with cotton, you know, both of the sacks are of equal size, but the sack that is filled with cotton is lighter, yeah. you know, whereas the sack that is filled with metal is heavier. You know, so the sack can be the same. So the value can, the CT value can be the same. For example, we can take a CT value of 12. Both can have the same value of CT value, but one is cotton and one is metal. And the metal will give you a more significant response of infection compared to the cotton. You know, so you cannot, you cannot, um, you know, like um, Make up. generalize it for all people. You know, you cannot generalize it. So the way we interpret the city value, we have to have other, other, uh, you know, other additional information to to uh, talk on the city value. So we need to see the 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 condition of the patient to interpret the city value. You oh. know, so the city value can be same for two individuals, but the interpretation may be different. You know, so it there is a lot of factors that affect it. You know, the virulency of the virus can affect it. The, 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 the technician, the machine that's used can affect it. The technician who is doing the test can affect it. You know, so, so you know, like we, we, till today, we are not able to, uh, to check the viral load. 
through our PCR machine. Yeah. So, but sometimes we, if we go to a normal clinic or something like that, maybe it, it is sometimes that they, I heard that some people, they don't get the city value. You mean to say there are different machines? Uh, the, the, there will be no city value when the, the test is negative. Okay. Okay. Basically, and the machines will, uh, will count, will have the city value if they are positive. Uh, the RT, the real time PCR will have the city value. But this TCM test, that's the quick test. Yeah. The quick test of the molecular test, that mm. will not have a CT value. Okay. You know, so again, it depends on the test that you are doing mm. to, and, uh, to know the CT value. You know, so if you do the TCM test, you may not have a CT value. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then is chest CT scans and blood tests mandatory? Uh, is positive. So yes, the 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 accord the radio the the chest radiology and blood tests may not show any changes in the first phase of the infection, you know. So according to the the uh, the data that we get from Hong Kong, mm -hmm. you know, the the chest X-ray and the blood uh, level changes later on in the in the infection process. And sometimes we see changes only after the day 10, day 11, you know, so, so you can go for, CT, uh, for the chest uh, CT scans only after the day 10 or, or how? Uh, we have to again cater it individually. Okay. So it, based, it is based on the individual symptoms, you know, like um, I wouldn't encourage, you know, I wouldn't encourage uh, people following their friends. Mm. You know, just because their friend do, does a blood test and a chest x-ray, you know, when you get diagnosed with, yeah, you, you know, it's not the same for everyone. So, okay. you know, when you get uh, infected with a virus, please consult to your doctor because the, your doctor will be able to guide you when you need the x-ray and the lab findings, you know, okay. so it's really very individual and you have to cater it person to person. So okay. it will be mandatory at a certain phase of time. But it, let the doctor decide when is the time to do the test. And not all people will need the test. You know, people with mild disease does not need the test. The, the Hong Kong study shows that 20% of individuals with uh, COVID-19 may have no changes at all, either in the blood test or in the chest x-ray. Okay. Thank you, doctor. So we have another uh, three more questions. There are lots of tests available to diagnose the SARS-CoV-2. What are the differences and where should one do their test, lab, clinic, or hospitals? Is D-dimer level associated with, this, the, with the severity of the COVID-19? Is it necessary to check our D-dimer when we contract the virus? What antibody levels are necessary for COVID-19 protection? Um. So uh, to my knowledge, you know, we have two tests that is very commonly used at this moment for the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. You know, we have the antigen test and we have the RT-PCR test, the real-time PCR test. So the real-time PCR test actually identifies the genetic of the virus, whereas the antigen test identifies the protein of the virus. So uh, to the gold standard till today is the PCR test because you identify the genetic of the virus. Yeah. Uh, what, so, where should we do it? Like advisable in the lab, clinic or hospitals? So an antigen test is pretty simple. You know, it can be conducted in, in, a, you know, in an outpatient clinic. It can be conducted in a lab and it can be conducted even at home. Okay. You know, so people, we do have the home kit. You know, and with our cases that's, you know, emerging, you know, I think we have 29,000 cases today, mm -hmm. you know, you, we, we honestly want people to be independent, you know, so, so if you have symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, if you have symptoms of flu, you know, like as we mentioned earlier, you, it's fine for you to do a home kit antigen test, okay. you know, so if your home kit antigen test is positive, you're likely going to be positive, whether you proceed to do a PCR or not. You know, so the only difference right now is, you know, like if your antigen kit is positive, stay home, you know, stay isolated. Okay. You know, 
Then we and, need to for the PCR test after how many days of antigen test? You don't have to do a PCR test after an antigen test if you're symptomatic. Okay, if you're not symptomatic. If you're, if you're not symptomatic, you know, and, and you are in close proximity, mm -hmm. the antigen test may be negative. You know, you need to go through a PCR test because the PCR test is the gold standard. Okay. What if some cases happens like the antigen is uh, positive and the PCR is negative? What happens in that case is like, what do we do? So it is, it is very unlikely that that happens in a symptomatic case that can happen in an asymptomatic case. And it's usually, there are various factors, again, playing a role in that. You know, it's either the test is conducted incorrectly or the test kit is not appropriate. You know, so the test kit has been, you know, has been kept in a non-appropriate way. You know, it has been preserved in an inappropriate way. You know, so if that can produce a false positive result for an antigen. So we still need to doubt ourselves whether we are positive or not. We can do another test just to be sure. Or we Which is a PCR test. Which is a PCR test. Yes. And is the PCR D dimer is a confirmatory test? Yeah. And is the D dimer associated with the severity of the COVID-19 in the blood test? So uh, there it's not only the D dimer. You know, there are various uh, markers that as doctors, we need to look into to, you know, to, to know the severity of the infection. Mm -hmm. So we don't only look at the D-dimer individually, you know, so when we go by the clinical symptoms of the patient, we determine mm -hmm. as physicians, we determine which test we want to do for a person. And then we have to interpret that, uh, that all those markers together. So we cannot do an independent D-dimer and identify whether the person is going to have a severe uh, COVID infection or not, you well, know, not because there are other markers that we have to take into consideration. Okay. We need to look at the D-dimer. We need to look at the sedimentation rate. We need to look at the ferritin level. We need to look at the, you know, CRP. So there are many markers that we have to combine mm. to identify, to risk rectify our patient. Okay, so basically what are the standard uh, blood tests we need to do if we, uh, we require... A... There is no standard at this moment. It okay. has to be catered to a patient individually. Okay. And this it depends on your underlying medical condition. It depends on your age. It depends on what you're experiencing. It depends on how severe your, uh, your symptoms are. You know, so the doctor that you are consulting with should be able to risk rectify you you know, and to identify what they need from you, what tests they need for you to do. Okay. And what antibody levels are necessary for COVID-19 protection? An interesting question. Yeah, so, so at this moment, throughout the world, I would say, you know, we cannot check for the neutralizing antibody. Okay, so the, what we are testing right now is the quantitative, the general quantitative antibody and the spike virus antibody. You know, it's the antibody towards a particular part of the virus. You oh. know, we are not able to test for the neutralizing antibody, which is our body, it's our body antibody. Okay. You know, so to check for our neutralizing antibody, we need a live virus. So, so you know, the antibodies that we have in our blood is taken, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we put it to the live virus and we see, you know, whether the antibody that we have will kill the live virus, you know, but that is very, very, very risky because the person will have to work with a live virus, which at this present moment is not recommended, you know. So as a result, till today, we are not able to identify a level that can give protection. Okay. Thank you, doctor. So we move to the fourth segment. Okay, this is regarding medicines. I'll go uh, the first question. For first aid COVID kit, which medicines, medical supplies should one keep as standby at their homes? Doctor. 
Do you want to read all the questions first? Then I'll general like general. Some doctors uh, use general. azithromycin and some doctors use doxycline. Which is better? Sorry, spelling mistake. Can afimectin cure COVID-19? If so, what is the dosage? We heard people die because of blood clot in severe cases. Can we take blood thinner such as cardio aspirin? Okay. So there is no drug of choice for COVID, unfortunately. There is no standard medications for COVID at this moment. The COVID is a viral infection. Yeah, so it's a viral infection. You have to trust your immune system to fight against this infection. When we are born, we are already given the gift of our immune system. It's mm -hmm. these moments that we lost the trust in our own immune system. And as a result, we depend on all synthetic medications to build our immune system. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only our immune system that is the best drug of choice, that is the best kit that we have to preserve to fight for the COVID viral infection. You know, all the medications you mentioned, the azithromycin, the doxycycline, the ivermectin, those are still on clinical trials. You know, so antibiotics, doxycycline and uh, azithromycin are both antibiotics. Antibiotics are used for bacterial infection. It's not used for a viral infection. Large clinical trials has been conducted for azithromycin in developed countries. You know, so in Western countries, they've looked into azithromycin. It doesn't have any benefit towards the viral infection. It is beneficial when given for a bacterial infection. Oh. You know, so when a person has a viral infection with a superimposed bacterial infection, yes, we need to give azithromycin or doxycycline, oh. but it is the doctor's decision let the doctor decide for you. Let your medical doctor provide you the consultation and advise you on the medications you need to take. You know, so ivermectin, also a small clinical trial. Mm -hmm. You know, so all these medications are not without side effects. All these medications can mm -hmm. cause your blood pressure to be messed up. It can cause your heartbeats to be messed up. You know, so please consult your doctors when you want to take medications. You know, their medical you know, like history. your doctors will know your medical condition. Right. So uh, the question number one, what is the first aid COVID kit? So what do we actually have? You know, like I'm seeing people- Your immune system. Buying this medicine, that medicine, people are buying them. How it may be out of that uh, panicky state. Yeah, saying? I think I think most are the medications I use for treatment of fear, not for the treatment of COVID. Okay. So basically, I, I mean that's very. Sorry, technical error. I'm very sorry. Can you hear me, Dr. Varka? Yes, I can hear you, Susie. Okay. okay. Uh, we go to the, are we done with the medicines? Yeah, we go to the next segment. That will be the vaccine. The vaccine, we have six questions. I shall read the first three questions. Do we need to consult a doctor before taking a vaccine? or do a blood test? If so, what are the blood tests needed? How effective is Sinovac vaccine in fighting the Delta variant? For those who have taken two shots of the Sinovac vaccine, are they allowed to take Pfizer, Astra, or any other vaccine for booster? If yes, within what span of time? Okay, so if you have an underlying medical condition, Yes, please consult your doctor before taking a vaccine. Yeah. Uh, blood test is not always needed if you're healthy, but in certain medical conditions, you want to assess the individual first before getting the vaccine. Okay. So consult to the doctor who knows your medical condition. Yeah. 
uh, effectiveness on the various vaccines. Yeah, so we have heard a lot of vaccines available right now. We've got the Sinovac, we've heard about the Sinopharm, the AstraZeneca, the Pfizer, the Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson. So all these vaccines are effective 100% to prevent the severity of the illness. So we will strongly recommend to get the vaccines. And the best vaccine is the one that is available for you. You know, so whatever vaccine is available for you, please get them because they are proven to prevent the severity of the illness. Yeah. Okay. Yes, these vaccines do not prevent you from getting infected with the virus. Okay, so you still have to follow the 5M protocol to avoid getting infected. So it is not a 100% shield. It's not a 100% shield to get infected. Okay. But at least we can prevent the severity of the infection. At least we can prevent the hospital admissions. At least we can prevent the ICU admissions when you're fully vaccinated. And what I mean by fully vaccinated is four weeks after your second dose of your Sinovac vaccine. Mm. Or for AstraZeneca, at least four weeks after the first dose of your uh, Astra vaccine. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, we have another uh, question for question number four, five, six is which vaccine is the safest, especially for children below 10 and adults above 50? Is vaccine combination like AstraZeneca and Pfizer effective? If it is, can you suggest which combination? So, uh, okay, so there have been no vaccines, no data of safety of vaccines still today for children below 12 years old. So, um, yes, we, for children 12 to 16, Pfizer has uh, taken out its data of safety. Yeah, and we are hearing that Sinovac is also giving the, the data on safety for children 12 years and above. So we are not, you know, we don't have data for vaccines for children below 10 years. Okay. Maybe it might come, you know, so studies are ongoing for six years and above. Yeah. Hopefully by December, we may have more information. Okay. Yeah. There is no data for a combination of vaccine till today. Okay. Oh, yeah. So it's a personal choice if a person wants to combine two vaccines. Yeah. Okay. So it's entirely risk is entirely in your hands if you decide to combine two vaccines. Yeah. So no data on safety has been published for combining two vaccines. You know, maybe we will know more about it because people are getting these vaccines. So yeah, you know, like the, uh, people are getting the com com combined combination vaccine. vaccines. Yes, yeah. people are getting okay. combination vaccines at the present yeah. moment at their own wish, at okay. their own you know with their own consent. So they're willing to take their own risk. You so, mean to say, at the combination vaccine at the same time when they are vaccinated, or so, you mean to say there's a time difference or? So what I have heard, what I am yeah. hearing, you know, like uh, in overseas, you know, people are taking um, AstraZeneca four weeks later, taking the Pfizer oh, vaccine, okay. you know, so it's still under study, you know, it's still all being studied, you know, so these people who take these combined vaccines are, are materials of study for us. You know, so we okay. gather these information. So hopefully in, you know, a couple of months, we will know more information as people start doing it. But at the present moment, people doing it are taking the risk at their own self. You know, so we are not recommending it. And there's no data published on safety and complications related to combining of two vaccines. Okay, coming back to the third question, there was someone asking me again that after taking the two shots of the Sinovac vaccine, are they allowed to take the Pfizer or Astra as a booster? And what is the span of time? So, so the vaccines are safe, you know, mm -hmm. but, but at this moment, we all are aware that these vaccines has been studied only over a period of one year. Okay. We don't even know the long-term side effects of these vaccines. So... Yes, you know, like you, you can take it, as I mentioned, but it's entirely at your own risk. 
So no doctors will recommend combining the vaccines at this point of time. Hmm. You know, so at the moment, studies are ongoing that, you know, with particular vaccines, you know, the mm -hmm. immunity goes down with time. You know, so it is being studied that over a period of six months, a person may lose their immunity. But again, those data are not yet published. You oh. know, so combination of vaccines, the the duration, the span of time before taking two vaccines, there's no data at this moment, and we have to wait for more information. Okay. Uh, another question is that what are the, some of the common side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, it's usually pain at the site of injection, redness at the site of injection. Some people may get headaches. Some people may get body aches. Some people may have increased appetite. Some people may, you know, have prolonged mm -hmm. sleep. You know, they may feel tired. You know, so everybody has different reactions. But normally, how long does the symptoms last, doctor? Like a day? Usually, a, usually about two to three days. Okay. And then, you know, so, fine. yes, that's, that's fine. You can take paracetamol, you can take ibuprofen just to help you out with these symptoms. But it's very short lasting and it would clear up on its own. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we shall go to the next segment. Okay. We have a uh, few general questions here. How to do a proper isolation at home? How to do a proper isolation at home to prevent transmission of the virus to others? The same way you do your prevention at home is the same way you do your prevention outside home. So if you have a case in the house, that case should definitely be on full room isolation with own bathroom. You want to maintain the two meters distance of contact if the room is well ventilated and you want to use double mask or the N95 mask. You want to keep hand washing all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's the way you prevent from the virus. Okay, there are some cases people isolating in uh, like in a hotel or in, a, in an apartment and they need to order their food from outside. Is that okay to order the food from outside? It's okay for the for them to order the food from outside, but they should not meet the person delivering the food to them. So as long as there's an ability to uh, to just attach the, the food mm -hmm. the, or the paper bag in front of the door, that's okay. As long as the, the person, the case, is not in contact with the person who delivers the, the items or the food to them. And we heard that some people say that we need to put the food in under the sun and we do all that stuff of spraying the food. Is, is that transmission? Transmission. The vomite, the vomite transmission through food or through solid, uh, solid materials are extremely low. Okay. The higher uh, transmission is from human to human. Okay. From the droplets, basically, the small particles of the droplets. Okay. Another question, how can I help a family member with COVID-19 at home? And what is the minimum distance to be kept from each other to avoid transmission? I think basically it's two meters, what you said earlier. And that's how correct. Can help? You mean they need to use Ape Day or anything they need to, actually they're looking after the, the, the family member, like a wife taking care of the husband or vice versa. Uh, if the, if, so if an individual, you know, if a spouse or as a child would want to take care of the case at home, the, that particular individual need to make sure that they isolate as well together with the patient. So they cannot be doing two things at a time. They cannot be attending to the patient at home and going back to work because that is how the transmission will never end. So if you decide, you first need to make a decision whether you want to stay isolated with the patient and take care of the patient, okay? Uh, okay. There is always a high risk for the caregiver to have to get to contract the infection as well. You can follow the protocols, you know, which is definitely the double mask or the N95 mask, maintaining the two meters distance. But, you know, like there is always a risk as long as you're ready for it, go ahead with it, but just don't spread it to people outside. You know, so you need to make the decision on what your choice is. 
So you mean to say if we are taking care of a family member, it is advisable for us to be home, stay home. Till that Correct. recovers. Okay. Correct. In order not that we transmit that disease to another person. That's right. We definitely want to cut the transmission at this point of time. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And the third question, in case of emergency and hospitals are full, what is the first thing or aid that should be done to the patient before anything worse happens? Call your doctor. Speak to your doctor. There is, everyone is producing telemed. Even the government has uh, resources to do telemed. So okay. if one doctor is occupied, go okay. to another doctor. You just have to get whatever is available for you right now. Unfortunately, Suppose a panicky situation comes, Dr. Varka. Suppose a panicky situation. It's like the person is breathless and we didn't know that this is going to happen. So, and we try to call and, you know, we are not blaming the doctors and we can understand that at this situation, all the doctors are busy and even the hospitals sometimes do not pick up the phone directly. So what is the first thing at home that we should do? I keep, the patient, keep the patient comfortable. Okay. Keep the patient com comfortable, give the positivities to the patient, encourage the patient, you know, the, the, a lot of the time, the stressor reduces the immune system. You panic, you cause panic in the patient as well. You know, give the positivity to the patient. You know, encourage the patient while you get in touch with the doctor. I heard people in this panicky situations go and try to get, I mean, uh, rent an oxygen tank and all that. How do we actually make use of this oxygen tanks and oximeters, which, we are, which are now very much in need, they say? So oximeter is a good guide on the oxygen level of the individual. Okay. Yeah. So, so yes, it is, it is good to have an oximeter just, you know, just to help you, to guide you, especially if you have an elderly person at home. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but oxygen tank, you know, you're not, you're not trained to use oxygen. You know, you, you, you're not sure, hmm. you know, like it's not completely without risk. Yeah. You know, giving, giving a high level of oxygen can be harmful to the person. Giving a high level of oxygen can cause complications in the lungs. You know, so at the end of the day, you will have to still consult with a physician to determine on the oxygen use. Okay. Uh, another question is, one, once a person recovers from COVID-19, how long will the body be immune to? And will the person still be immune to other variants? Immunity depends body to body. You know, at the present moment, we are we are taking 90 days as the as the cut line. But of course, we are seeing people still immune despite, you know, despite the 90 days. You know, again, as I have spoken about the immune levels, we do not know the level that a person is protected from the infection. You know, we cannot check the neutralizing antibodies still today. You know, so will the person be immune to the other variants? At the moment, we still recommend vaccinations to pro protect against other variants. We believe, mm -hmm. we believe that your immunity is only for that particular variant. But again, okay. we may be wrong, you know, so we may have to wait for more information. But at this particular moment, we are still recommend vaccinations for those who have got the infection because we believe that the vaccinations can protect to other variants which your own auto antibody will not be able to at this moment so you mean once the person recovers his immunity also takes time to recover i mean is it does it immediately shoot up or it comes back to normal or how 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 does it work? when a person when a person is mm -hmm. infected with the infection it does take time for the person to build the immunity and okay. as the days goes with months the immunity drops down oh okay and another question is what are some known manifestation of post covid-19 conditions right this is also something new so okay. i mean the person asking this question must have done a lot of reading <laughs> so so, so we, 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 we currently know what we call as a long COVID effect. So this long COVID effect happens after a person gets infected with the COVID-19 infection. Apparently, it takes three months 
mm. uh, for this long COVID effect. You know, so some people may have prolonged uh, tiredness, prolonged fatigue. You know, some people unfortunately develop the autoimmune thrombocytopenia. That's a autoimmune condition which affects the platelet count. Some people later on we are we find out that they develop scarring tissues in the lungs. Okay, so these are what we call as the long COVID effects. So at this moment, uh, you know, studies are still ongoing. You know, lung functions are being uh, determined and assessed if that can identify more issues. You know, but the little that we know right now that yes, there is what we call as a long COVID effect that as physicians, we need to keep a close eye on and which can last up till three months. So if you do have symptoms over the next 90 days after you develop an mm -hmm. infection, please contact your doctor. Please call the doctor who has taken care of you and know your medical ongoing condition. Now, do you suggest any CT scans after, I mean the thorax scan after the uh, post-COVID condition? After the post-COVID conditions, anything as such? No. So the lung will regenerate on its own. Okay. You know, so it's a natural okay. process of all the cells of a human being to generate on its own. Yeah. So so we are built, you know, God has gifted us. We are built with that ability. You know, so you know, like if you have no symptoms, if you have no complaints, you know. It's not necessary unless mm -hmm. your doctor wants to check on it. Okay, if you have an underlying medical condition and you know that you're prone to get it, your doctor will tell you to do it. You know, so again, don't do things on your own. You would not know how to interpret it. Please consult your doctor who will be able to tell you what to do and what not to do. Okay. And uh, what are the suggestions regarding the post COVID recovery? Stay happy, build your immunity, you know, be positive, you know, don't avoid, no, don't invite any negativity. It's a viral infection. Trust in your immune system. Your immune system is built to fight virus infections. Thank you, doctor. We go to the next question. We have still another questions. Okay, for the general questions in this situation. In this situation, it is advisable. Is it as a, is it advisable to proceed with vaccinations such as MMR and other vaccines for children? We still suggest doing vaccinations for children, but the important vaccinations uh, need to be discussed with your pediatrician. So again, this is very individualized. You know, so your pediatrician will be able to guide you on what is the essential vaccines needed for your child. So consult your pediatrician, get their advice, what is important to take now and what can wait. Okay. And what are the organs most affected by COVID-19? COVID-19 can be without symptoms. COVID-19 can be having mild symptoms with no organs affected at all. Hmm. Yes, there are 2% fatality with COVID-19. So 2% death rates with COVID-19. Usually what happens is, um, you know, like the, the infection, you know, the, there will be a process of inflammation that's triggered by this COVID infection, mm. you know, and the inflammation leads uh, in one organ will affect the other organs. Mm. So unfortunately, those 2% two, uh, 2 mortality is related to a complicated multi-organ failure. You know, so one organ will lead to another organ if being affected. Okay. So there is no specific organ. Unfortunately, the human body is, you know, the, all the organs mm -hmm. in the body is interconnected mm -hmm. with one and another. You know, so it causes an inflammation which can be in any part, which then affects the other part of the organs as well. Okay. And another question is, in what conditions does COVID-19 survive the longest? Um, I'm not very sure about that question. Okay. Can you ex yeah, I explain? I have permission does COVID-19 survive the longest. It may be uh, it, it, the person meant by this uh, underlying medical conditions, like, you know, maybe some people take two weeks, three weeks to recover. So a 
for uh, as per the CDC recommendation, okay, if you have passed the 10 days from your initial symptom and you are totally symptom free, you are least likely to spread the infection to another person. Okay? okay, so why is the PCR still positive? The PCR is still positive because it is detecting the, the viral materials. You know, in a PCR, if you see, you know, you all must be uh, seeing the gene S, the gene N, the gene M, mm. that those are the parts of the virus that's detected in the PCR. And each machine detects different genes. You know, uh, one machine may be detecting gene S, the other machine may detect the gene M. The third machine may be detecting the gene E. Mm. You know, those are the virus parts itself. Okay. Okay. Now, again, to make it more complicated, you know, besides this virus part, there is other parts like the blood of a human being that's also there in the virus. You know, that is oh, what we okay. identified as the ORF1A or ORF1B. You know, that's a part of the virus, but not the virus itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like these. Yeah, so, so I think the, basically it also depends on the underlying medical conditions of the person in their history or it does, it does. No, uh, I mean, it, irrespective, according to the CDC, irrespective mm -hmm. of the underlying medical condition, mm -hmm. if you have, if you have completed 10 days from okay. your initial symptoms and you are totally symptom free for 24 hours, you are mm -hmm. least likely to spread the infection. But the PCR identifying all these that I mentioned earlier can still be positive, but the PCR machine cannot tell you whether this virus is alive or dead. Okay. You know, so according to you know, according to the literatures that we are reading right now, these particles of the virus can be detected in the PCR machine up till 90 days. You know? Oh, okay, okay. So it is, you know, it can clear up between two weeks up till 90 days. That's why some countries, you know, like UK, is not recommending a test over the next 90 days once you recover from a COVID infection. So what happens if the person check and they're positive after two weeks, after three weeks, after one month, they are, and, and then they are still positive in their PCR? Then what do they do? It, they, it actually does not mean anything. Mm. You know, again, again, you know, like if they're totally symptom free, Mm. you know they're least likely to spread the infection but okay. you know as you know we want to be a hundred percent sure percent sure yeah that we're not passing the infection you know so the reason for the pcr any test, test we need to do beside the pcr to make ourselves hundred percent sure no not not to what we are aware at this present moment okay so the but the the studies that the cdc the cdc has come up to that statement is because they have done a lot of studies as well you know, so, so so the CDC and the WHO are the top most, uh, you know, the, the top most communicable disease center, you know, who is yeah. providing the guidance to the entire world, you know, so them taking out a statement must be based yeah. on a lot of trials. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, question number 10, is it safe to go for a walk and jog? I mean, outside the house. Yes, or I think we covered that. Yeah, uh, that it's way. safe to and walk. Dr. Walk. Marta, is it that we have to still use a mask if we are walking in, a, in our complex where we know there was, there's no one around or how? Or we, we have to keep on using our mask? If you are alone mm -hmm. without anybody and you are not going to meet anybody, the problem is, you know, like yeah. I will still recommend using a mask okay. because you never know who you meet on the road and you will unknowingly you know, then technically yeah. as a human nature, you will yeah. talk to that person, you yeah. know, automatically. Okay. You know, so it's to, just yeah. best safe to still okay. use your mask. Okay. okay. What are the chances of infants contracting the virus and how severe could it be? Unfortunately, the virus does not spare anybody. You know, you get an infant can get it, a toddler can get it, a young individual can get it, an elderly person can get it. So they don't spare anybody. 
But no, this you see, if, uh, I would say like a baby of uh, three months, four months, if they contract the virus, then, you know, normally this uh, babies like to have this normal influenza also. Yeah. So how do you actually know that they are actually contracting the virus? The swab test. Unfortunately, swab babies test. can get swab. Swab test? Yeah, oh. yeah. Yes, unfortunately, they may need to go through the swab test too because that's mm -hmm. the definitive way of testing. Okay, so again, again, you go by the clinical symptoms. Again, you want to consult to the pediatrician, you want to consult with your family doctor, how far mm -hmm. you want to go in testing, or do you want to go by the clinical condition? So, okay. yep. Uh, number 12, some people contracting the virus post-vaccination with mild to severe symptoms, how is it so? So the vaccine yes. is definitely proven. All the, all the vaccines that has, be re, has been released now has definitely been proven not to cause the COVID infection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you get an infection, it's not related to the vaccination. It may be likely that you already have the virus when you went for the vaccination and the symptoms presented unfortunately a couple of days after the vaccination okay or or during the vaccination process itself there was no physical distancing maintained you mm -hmm. went with a group of people you know you know, you chit chatted yeah. with a distance of less than two meters for more than 15 minutes. Usually it's, you know, it's a human character that when you meet up your friends, you talk to your friends, you forget time. You know, you take more than 15 minutes and you just lose track of time, you know? So, and unfortunately that person also has the virus and transmits it to you, you know? So it's not related to the vaccine. There's other possible, uh, other possibilities for you to get the virus and not with the vaccination. Okay. I go to the shop wearing my mask and take proper precautions, already vaccinated and one day was tested positive. How can one protect oneself from this situation? I mean, this uh, taking all kinds of precautions and maintaining the protocols. Yes, so which type of mask? Again, the you know, you need a tight fit mask, you need a double mask, you know, so, if you do not wear a proper mask, that's a risk, okay? If you, you know, if you unfortunately, you know, your hands are contaminated with the virus, you know, you touch your eyes, your nose, you know, you can get infected as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not only wearing the mask, it's also the hand wash, it's also the hand sanitizer, okay? So you need to take all those precautions, okay? And already vaccinated, you know, uh, again, are you fully vaccinated? You know, fully vaccinated, as I yeah, said, is four weeks. The first, the first dose and the second dose. First dose, second dose, and four weeks later. Oh, okay. You know, so it's not immediately after the second dose you're fully vaccinated. You still can mm -hmm. get infection after the second dose. You have to wait for four weeks before you call yourself fully immunized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can one protect oneself from this situation? Well, you just have to do the max you can. You know, and the moment you step out of your house, irrespective, you are taking the chance, especially with the widespread transmission that we have right now. You know, you just, you know, when you, when you decide to step out the house, you need to prepare yourself that you are going to be exposed. Okay. So really, really take care. At this moment, yes. Okay, we are done with our questions and answers, but we also have some questions coming on my handphone. Is it safe to inhale steam and should should we put Minya Kayaputi in the steam? Uh, steaming is an alternative way, you know, so there's no clinical trials, there's no evidence on it, but since it's not harmful, you know, we wouldn't stop anyone from doing it. So does it kill the virus which are in our nasals and then for three, th three, four days, we keep on doing this. Does it, does it help? The only data that we have is that heat, alcohol, soap, 
that you know like all those things uh, kills the virus okay. you know like whether the steaming really kills the virus in your you know in your breathing you know in your nasal mm-hmm. cavity no one has done a research okay and maybe it's a good you know maybe maybe it's a good thought for someone to do a research but it's going to be hard you know because there'll mm-hmm. be you know testing to be conducted before and after the steaming you know so yeah there's no there's no clinical evidence but since it's not harmful you know no no trials has been conducted for it Yes. It's 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 an alternative remedy. So it's again a personal choice. Correct. We have another question. Uh, fully vaccinated and getting covid after 2 months. Fully vaccinated means she has done two doses and then after 2 months she got the covid. Yes. So that's possible. That's possible. uh again you know we still do not have data on uh, the variants that these vaccines cover you know so uh, we don't know why you know we have not got any data mm-hmm. published from sinovac vaccine and um you know the only data that we have received right now that's evidence based is that pfizer it has definitely released its uh, paper that it covers all the four variants uh again it doesn't cover 100% so uh, it doesn't cover even 100% shield it does it doesn't protect 100% shield so we have only data regarding astra and pfizer till date okay. you know so i'm sure i'm sure sinovac is still working on it as well and we probably will hear more you know more data after this so we can't tell you know and you know we can't blame it to sinovac mm-hmm. you know because it, it it does it's it does its work you know it prevents the severity as i said all these vaccines prevents the severity and the mortality and the icu admissions of an individual another question dr varka if someone has flu and have tested antigen negative uh, i mean he the person has an influenza I, I, flu symptoms is it necessary to do pcr but is antigen okay. negative okay uh, there are two ways to approach this case okay so no it's not necessary for you to go for a pcr if you can isolate so at the present moment we are encountering a pandemic which means that the spread of this virus is extremely fast and uh, we cannot differentiate from an influenza we cannot differentiate from a common cold and from the uh, covid infection Mm. yeah so we treat because of the pandemic we treat mm. all the flu as covid-19 unless proven otherwise okay. yeah so if you are willing to isolate yourself for the 10 days period irrespective of whether it's an influenza or a common cold or a covid infection mm. you don't need to be tested okay but if you cannot stay home you cannot stay isolated Yes, confirm it with a PCR first. Okay. So depending on the person. Correct. So it's again an individual choice. Individual choice. Uh another one is which brand do we buy which brand to buy the oximeter? What is the best brand? Anybody the best buy? brand is the one that's available for you. The one that you can use when you need And- it. as now we are running out of stock i think in the market yes okay okay this is another question i think it's answered what we do what do we do when we have recently come into contact okay what do we do when we recently come to contact with someone who has the virus and maybe that person doesn't have a symptom but the person got in contact with the virus with the virus. so that person is considered as a case so the person has confirmed positive and is considered as a case so if you are in close proximity with that individual irrespective of mask use if you are close to them for more than 15 minutes less than 2 meters in distance you should quarantine yourself as well so the case should be isolated in their own room with their own bathroom but the person who is in close proximity to that individual should still stay home they don't need to be isolated in their own room but they still need to be quarantined in their own house basically the reason for this is your community responsibility because you don't want to spread the infection to other people 
-hmm. Okay, so you want to cut this transmission to help you to help us, you know, so to help reduce the, the amount of the infected people. Okay. And another person is asking, when I get a sore throat, first thing that occurs in my mind is panic. As our mind thinks the worst, where ex whereas, ex whereas actually sometimes we get sore throat, the normal sore throat, what is the first step we do? Normally take medicine, antibiotics, or we rush to do our PCR and antigen. Or antigen. Uh, stay calm, give it some time, isolate. So, you know, isolate for two to three days, let the virus multiply, and then do a PCR if the symptoms continue. Okay. And then when the person isolates themselves in the room, what about their clothes, their, uh, the cookware, and how do we actually take care of these items? You mean to say they wash their own clothes or how? That's, that's ideal. If they can clean up their own room and they can clean up their, their own, uh, they can wash their own clothes, that's the ideal situation. Maybe we all have to learn how to do it, you know, but... If it's not possible, at least, at least, you know, we can save the other person who is helping us by putting our, you know, putting our clothes, you know, we put it in a bag, a plastic bag, and the person who takes the clothes can, you know, use a glove, take the plastic bag and, you know, like push, uh, you know, wash the clothes for that person, or that's one alternative. The other alternative is get a bucket of water, soapy water, you know, so put the clothes, you know, like dump the clothes in a soapy water so that the person who takes the clothes will not get infected because we all know that soap kills the virus. Okay, another question is, let me go through this question. Uh, okay. Another question is regarding vaccination. It seems the person has taken the first dose of vaccine and they contract the coronavirus. What about the second vaccine? Uh, we still we still recommend, we still abide by waiting for 90 days before getting the other vaccine. Because uh, what we believe is if you have good immunity already, you know, and we keep giving, so if, for example, you have you know good immunity of 200, and we give you a vaccine. It will not go higher than 200 as well. You know, so if you have good immunity, you do not need added added injections to boost immunity. You know, so our our studies still today, you know, it may change in future, but our studies still today is to wait for 90 days before we give a shot. Okay. Okay, um, I think this already is answered. The person asked whether we take zinc daily and what is the dose, does vitamin D3 help? Okay, vitamin D3 help. So and zinc has already been replied, sister. Yeah, so yeah. zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, you know, those are what we study from our previous experiences. You know, so our previous experiences tells us that these help to boost your immune system. But, you know, like we can get all these not in the form of synthetic, you know, so we can get zinc, as I mentioned, from your, from your vegetables, from your green leafy vegetables. You can get the vitamin C from your uh, fruits, okay? Yes, we cannot get vitamin D from our food that we eat. So vitamin D, you can get from your sun exposure, you know? So again, as I mentioned, you know, all these can be harmful to you. And you can test it out because, you know, you do have toxic levels of vitamin D, which can be harmful to you. So if you are in doubt, you can speak to your doctor and your doctor will advise you on the dosage. And they might recommend you to do a blood test because you can check your levels of vitamin D and zinc through your blood test. But discuss it with your doctor. Again, don't do it on your own because you won't be able to interpret the results. At the end of the day, your doctor will be the one who will guide you. Okay, there's a person who has taken Pfizer and she contract she contract the uh, COVID. Yes. Pfizer, fully yes. vaccinated. Correct. After, correct. A month, after a month. That's correct. So the person is fully vaccinated because the person has taken two doses of Pfizer and is one month apart. 
the vaccines, as I said, does not give you a 100% shield. What we need to see right now, is that person having a severe disease or not? You know, so the vaccines prevents the severity of the illness, the ICU admissions, the hospital admissions. It does not it's prevent not 100% you. hundred percent shield. It does not prevent you from getting the vaccine irrespective of which vaccine you get. Okay. How do we deal with the medical waste? How do we dispose uh, in order not to contaminate the others of the person who is isolating at home? Put it in a plastic bag, you know, like tie it up so that nobody can dig into your plastic bag and throw it. And do you need to spray the whole house calling the disinfectant guy to actually spray the room of the person after he is test negative? That's a good way of actually supporting the disinfectant guy financially. You don't have to do it. You know, you certainly don't have to do it. You can do it yourself as well. You know, so you can clean it up yourself. You can use the alcohol, you know, wipes. You can use the, the, the you know, the bleach. You can dilute it. So you can actually do it yourself. But if you don't, you can certainly support these people. All right. Okay, um, and any other questions so far? I think we are almost done with the questions. Uh, one more question is, are we, uh, are we supposed to reheat the food which has come from outside or can consume them directly? Uh, as I mentioned, the, the fomite transmissions through these are, are minimal. You know, so again, that's a choice, whatever you feel comfortable, you know, you can re we know that heat definitely kills the virus, you know, so if you want to heat it, it's fine, but the risk of transmission, the, the formite transmission through these are extremely minimal. Okay, another last question. Is the vaccine for teens required? Has the side effects for kids been tested yet? Uh, depends on which vaccines. Okay, so China has definitely approved the uh, Sinovac vaccine, and I'm sure they have done the studies on the safety. You know, of course, it is not yet approved by WHO and CDC for the Sinovac for 12 years and above, but uh, China themselves has approved it. You know, so we hope to see more data coming up. Uh, Pfizer has certainly released its, uh, its data on the safety of vaccines. Yes, now they have a black black box warning about the possibility um, of the inflammation uh, in the heart in, re in regards to the vaccine for children below 16 years and above. But these adverse reactions are pretty mild and uh, it, doesn't it doesn't go to a complicated event. You know, so yes, it's a warning, but it's pretty handled uh, well that it doesn't go into a complicated situation. As I mentioned, we still need to learn more about this vaccines. So this vaccine is just one year old. So we may hear differently in days to come. Okay. What is the normal oxygen level for us to be aware in using the oximeter? So uh, I'll just uh, answer it in a different way. So the, mm. critical, the critical level of oxygen is actually below 90. Okay, so that's the critical level of oxygen in your oximeter, provided your oximeter battery is good and your oximeter is providing a good reading. There are many ways that your oximeter can be wrongly read. If your hands are cold, if you're having a panic attack, if you're having anxiety, your hands are pretty cold. You know, you put an oximeter there, it will give you a lower reading. You want to warm your hands first. You want to have good circulation in your hands. Uh, mm -hmm. What the oximeter reads is the oxygen level in your blood that circulates in your fingers. You know, okay. so if your fingers are cold, you know, your, your blood circulating over there is probably not appropriate, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's synced in, you know? So as a result, you'll get a lower reading. So don't panic. Keep yourself calm, you know, like warm your, you warm your extremities first and then get your reading. And you can, you know, you have 10 fingers. So you can do it in, you know, different fingers to see whether you really have a low reading or not. You know, personally with the oxygen, with the, you know, with the situation right now where the hospitals are fully booked, you know, like 
Hospitals are up to 100% capacity now. I usually go at a higher level. You know, I go at a 92 or 93 level. Again, I individualize it based on the person need, you know, and uh, how fast the person is going to deteriorate. You know, I, I take that level for each individual differently because I need time for this person to be able to get the, uh, the hospital bed. Okay, so okay. the, the evidence-based clinical uh, clinical fear if it goes below 90. Do we need to do the, the check of our oxygen like in everyday basis, like that particular time, or it can be on a different timings or how, how is that to check? Is it, level? are you talking for a person who is ill or yeah, for, for a, person a who is normal Ill. person? A, for, for uh, a person who is ill. Okay, so the, the, the frequency of testing will be determined by your doctor. So the frequency okay. of testing is very different person to person. It okay. depends on their underlying medical condition and how fast is the is the you know is the possibility of that person to deteriorate. And uh, what about for a normal person? Just checking on ourselves, like on daily basis. If you're normal, you don't need to be testing yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question is, please ask Dr. Verka, if we haven't done our vaccine, should we go for Sinovac, Astra, because it's available now at the moment, or, be, or we better wait for Pfizer, which is more protective, I mean higher protection? Uh, it depends on your exposure risk. And again, you know, for as doctors, you know, we recommend you to get any vaccine that's available is a good vaccine. Okay, so if you don't want to take the vaccine, it's your personal choice, but you know, you need to definitely avoid all exposures. You know, so I get, I get patients who tells me that, you know, like uh, I'm not exposed because I don't go out from my home, you know, but my husband goes to work and I share the room with my husband. So that's an equivalent exposure, you know? So if you are having other family members still going out of the house and you're in close communication with that particular family member, it means you are still exposed. So directly or indirectly, you're still exposed. So if you're exposed, get your vaccine. Okay. Uh, okay, this will be our last question. Sorry, Dr. Varka. Uh, hi, dear. What about veggies and fruits when we order from out? Do we wash it with salt water? So uh, veggies and vegetables that's eaten raw or fruits that's eaten unpeeled, you need to thoroughly wash it first because there's a risk not of the COVID infection, but there's a risk of other parasitic or bacterial infection to your stomach. Okay, so you want to thoroughly wash it. Uh, yeah, you can wash it with water multiple times. Some people wash it with uh, the bleach water and they rinse it again with water. And, you know, some people use the, the veggie wash, you know, so that's again a personal choice. Okay, I think we are almost done with our session, doctor. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Murka. We really appreciate your time and effort. I'm sure all of us can apply the knowledge shared by doctor. Words aren't enough to thank you and all the health professionals who have been on the front line since the beginning of the pandemic. But we, but we surely pray that Dr. Varkar, you're always healthy and Baba bless you and your family. We strongly urge everyone to follow the health protocols and the restrictions that have been imposed by the government. The very least that we can do is to prevent the spread of the virus and please do consult your doctor if you experience any symptoms. Do not delay your treatment and it is very vital to trust your doctors. Above all, we need to have strong faith that God will protect all of us. And we hope that everyone remain healthy and may the world heal soon. Baba bless us all. Thank you so much, Dr. Varka, once again. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you. Sairam, everyone. On behalf of the Sai Mahila Creative Hub of Sai Study Group Jakarta, we would like to thank Dr. Raka Lakshman for the insightful and informative session. The answers has made us all realize to pay more attention 
on our health and observe the most minute symptom. We shall be more careful and take good care of ourselves and those around us by staying at home. Thank you to the Mahila Wing for arranging this session. Thanks to our participants for joining and we hope you can carry back with you some handful informations which could be helpful to you and your family. We would also like to share some important informations about our hub. Our Mahila Creative Hub is open to everyone who's willing to share their knowledge and creativity. Those who would like to volunteer can kindly contact any of our Mahila team or Sai Study Group Jakarta. And we assure you, we shall slot you for our next session. Now, before we end, let's pray for those who are affected by COVID-19. The physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, and financial burdens are great. We pray especially for those who are risking their lives for the protection of others and for those who have lost their loved ones. We shall start with one Om and end it with three Shantis. Oh. Shanti, Shanti. Shanti. Jai Sai Ram. Thank you.